Okay, we're, we're ready to start. Is this okay? Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the library's reading club this evening. Um, let me temper the warmth of that welcome as usual by telling you very fiercely to switch off all mobile phones and any other noisy device that you have with you. Could you do that first? Thanks very much. <coughs> so it's a great pleasure and an honor for me to introduce Paul Cohen, who's the speaker for this evening. I need to get this right, so I'll read it. Paul Cohen is the Wasserman Professor of Asian Studies and History, Emeritus at Wellesley College. He's a longtime associate of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard and most importantly for us, an old friend of Hong Kong University. Um, Paul's books include Discovering History in China, American Historical Writing on the Recent Chinese Past, The Fabulous History in Three Keys, The Boxers as Event, Experience, and Myth, China Unbound, Evolving Perspectives on the Chinese Past, and plenty of others. I was enthralled to discover that his book, China and Christianity, was published 50 years ago. Yes. <coughs> and I don't look it, do I? By Harvard <laughs> University Press. So, as you can see, after a professional lifetime devoted to the study of history, Paul Cohn is starting to be an object of interest to his fellow historians. Um, <coughs> luckily for us, that marvelous stream of historiographical creativity um, is still going very strong, and the most recent evidence of this is the book that he'll be talking about this evening. Um, <clears throat> uh, personally, I haven't read all of Paul's books, but I've read enough to know that he's not the kind of writer who is content to write the same kind of book again and again. We know many writers like that, but for Paul, every new book really is a new adventure and a, a new approach to the subject. Um, and as I say, the evidence of this is the book he's talking about this evening, History and Popular Memory, The Power of Story in Moments of Crisis. Please welcome Paul Cohen. hear me? Yes? yes? yes. Okay. Right. Um, I passed out a, uh, a name list partly because uh, it's not something I've ever done if I've given a talk on Chinese history, particularly to an audience of people who are significant, not in significant numbers uh, of Chinese ethnicity. But um, I find that uh, the talk tonight will range among, across a, a, a larger geographical and cultural span. And some of the names that I will be pronouncing, I will be mispronouncing. Uh, if there are any students of Serbian culture here, you're likely to catch me on, uh, on some of those. So I think the, uh, there are also some more detailed information in the notes that you can just have uh, for reference uh, purposes. Um, in a recent uh, book, uh, History to uh, I have to get used to it. I haven't used one of these before. Um, history, uh, speaking to history, the story of King Gojen in 20th century China. I examined in some detail uh, the power that an ancient Chinese story uh, had at a number of key junctures um, in the history of China in the 20th century. During that span of time, the story's impact was greatest at moments of crisis, of protracted crisis. Um, the, the uh, mounting tension between China and Japan um, in the run-up to the Sino-Japanese War of 1937-45, and the predicament of Chiang Kai-shek's uh, beleaguered Guomindang on Taiwan after 1949. The right story in these circumstances, by presenting a model of the world that incorporated a favorable outcome for the crisis, pointed to a more hopeful uh, future. 
What especially intrigued me about this process was the resonance between story and situation, between a narrative and a contemporary historical tradition that prompted those living in it uh, to attach special meaning uh, to that narrative. Although such narratives can, in theory, uh, be ancient or modern, fictional or factual, uh, indigenous or foreign, the most potent ones are often those that derive from a culture's own past. While this has perhaps been unusually prevalent in China, where since time immemorial, um, people have had a strong affinity for stories uh, that have a, that have a, a historical uh, connection, um, the part taken by such stories, the ways in which they speak to history, has been compellingly demonstrated in many other societies as well. The British-born historian uh, Simon Shama, uh, for example, goes so far as to argue that Shakespeare's histories were not just the making of the bard, but the making of the English, too. Here is what he has to say about Laurence Olivier's film rendering of Henry V, which was released just months after D-Day, and thanks to Chris Munn, who's in the audience tonight, um, forms part of the fifth chapter of my, uh, of my book. Shakespeare awakened the historian in me. He seemed to deliver a certain idea of England at a time when all that was left otherwise was tea and cricket. In 1955, just 10 years after the war, it was as though the bard had scripted Churchill that the original happy few were prototypes for the boys who flew in spitfires. What now looks like the shamelessly chauvinistic film version made by Olivier in 1944 as a morale booster for DF, as, as a morale um, as a morale booster uh, for, for D-Day, sorry, made perfect sense to us even after the war had ended. Hadn't we all been in it together? Exeter, Harry the King, George the King, Winston, Dunkirk, the Blitz, Normandy. We band of brothers, for he who today sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. <clears throat> we needed the penance of Agincourt and Crispin St. Georgery of it all. For London was still a sooty, pea soup, fog shrouded place. Bombed out buildings in the city and East End sticking up like stumps of blackened teeth. I wish I could write like that. Yeah. Here's a, uh, a, a, a still of, um, of Olivier uh, making uh, his band of brothers uh, speech in the, um, in the Henry V uh, film. There are, of course, an infinite number of possibilities as far as the precise subject matter is concerned for the interplay between story and history. In the process of writing the Gojen book, I became sensitized to the overall pattern of how this interplay operated and thought it might be interesting to see what happened if I assembled in one place a number of cases all relating to a specific set of, uh, of issues. This takes me to the book um, I'm introducing to you uh, tonight. The six countries that are the book's focus, Serbia, Palestine, Israel, Soviet Union, Great Britain, China, and France, all faced severe crises in the course of the 20th century. The crises I've singled out to deal with in every instance involved a war uh, or the threat of war in response to which older historical narratives that embodied themes broadly analogous to what was taking place in the historical present were drawn upon by the populations and states affected. Creative works, plays, poems, films, uh, operas, and the like often played an important role in the recovery and revitalization of these narratives and as we would expect in the 20th century, nationalism took a vital part in each case. The reverberation between story and history is a phenomenon of no little historical interest, but it is exceedingly complicated 
reflecting deeply on how individual leaders or entire peoples or subgroups within a society position themselves in the space of, uh, of historical memory. The manner of this positioning varies significantly from instance to instance. Yet running through them all is a constant, which is the mysterious power that people in the present draw from stories that sometimes derived from remotest antiquity, and more often than not, recount events that have only the thinnest basis in an actual historical past. The question the eminent psychologist uh, Jerome Bruner uh, poses is central um, uh, with reference to this storytelling phenomenon, although he's not referring explicitly to history. Why, he asks, do we use story as the form for telling about what happens in life and in our own lives? Why not images or lists of dates and places and the names and qualities of our friends and enemies? Why this seemingly innate addiction to story? The power, the power of story, so common and yet so poorly understood, merits far more scrutiny than it is generally received from practicing historians. Bruner, in response to his own question, cautions, beware an easy answer. I hope that I have presented something other than an easy answer. I'll leave that for you to judge. My hope is that the multifaceted connections developed in my book between story and history in a range of different cultural settings and historical circumstances may serve to illuminate the problem he, uh, he poses. Since the older stories involved never supplied an exact match to what was currently taking place in history, they were regularly modified to a greater or lesser degree to make the fit a little bit closer. This is where popular memory became important. Popular memory, what people in general believe took place in the past, is often a quite different animal from what serious historians, after carefully sifting through the available evidence, judge to have actually taken place. This distinction between memory and history, vitally important to historians who are likely, is often blurred in the minds of ordinary folks, that is, non-historians. Well, I don't mean that as an insult to any of you who aren't historians. Um, who are likely to be more emotionally drawn to a past that fits their preconceptions, a past that they feel comfortable and identify with, uh, than a past that is true um, in some more rigorously objective sense. This blurring, of course, great is, uh, is of course greatly facilitated when, as a result of the dearth of historical evidence, or the unreliability of such evidence as has, has survived, uh, even professional historians cannot know with absolute confidence what took place in the past. Such is the case with each of the examples I explore in the book. But as I point out again and again, even when, each of the, uh, even when there exists a minimum core of certainty uh, about what happened in the past, that Joan of Arc, for example, was burned at the stake in 1431, or that in uh, the year 73 CE, a confrontation took place at the mountaintop fortress of Masada on the eastern edge of the Judean desert, overlooking the Dead Sea between a small band of Jewish warriors and a vastly stronger Roman force, or that a young Russian prince known to history as Alexander Nevsky in 1242, led his people uh, in, uh, in, in the defeat of an invading force of German knights in what would now be um, Western, the westernmost Russia. Even when this minimal core of certainty about the past exists, the power of the historian's truth often has a difficult time competing with the power of the right story despite the latter's having been seriously distorted 
by myth or political manipulation. A major goal of my book is to attain a, a better understanding of why this is so. But I also see it as having a larger import. As a lifelong historian of China, my work has centered on a single country and culture. This book is different. In it, although there is a chapter drawn from Chinese history, it is just one case among several having neither more nor less weight than the chapters devoted to France, Serbia, uh, the Soviet Union, and, and, and the, other, the other countries I deal with. The focus of the book, rather than being on a particular country or culture, is on a supracultural phenomenon, the part taken by story in popular memory that may well be universal, and if not, is certainly encountered in a vast array of places around the world, regardless of the linguistic, religious, social, cultural, and other differences that pertain among the peoples inhabiting these places. In brief, what we have, I would argue, is a different sort of world history, not the conventional kind based on conjunctures, uh, comparisons, uh, and influences, but one that is manifested in recurring patterns, clearly bearing a family resemblance to one another, yet independently arrived at and very possibly rooted in certain human propensities, above all the universality of storytelling in the human experience that transcend the specificities of culture and place. The phenomenon of story adaptation that I discuss in each of the book's chapters differs, of course, in detail from case to case. But the underlying process is reasonably consistent. Let me give uh, a couple of examples. And here your name sheets will come in handy, I think. Uh, one is the Battle of Kosovo of 1389, widely perceived as the central event in Serbian history and eventually serving as the cornerstone of Serbian national consciousness. The battle, which took place on the field of blackbirds several kilometers northwest of the modern, uh, the modern day uh, capital uh, of, of uh, Kosovo, Pristina, um, was fought between the Serbs, led by Prince Lazar, um, and an invading army of the Ottoman Empire under the leadership of Sultan Murad I. The differences between the mythology and the actual historical circumstances surrounding the battle are substantial. In terms of its military consequences for the fate of the early Serbian state, the Battle of Kosovo was not nearly as important as, the, as an earlier Ottoman victory in the Battle of the Maritza River, River Valley, which took place in 1371 in what is now um, Bulgaria. It's on the very far um, uh, to the very, the, right, the rightmost part of the, uh, of the map, you can see Bulgaria. Or uh, the events of 1459, 70 years after the Battle of Kosovo, when Serbia finally succumbed to the Ottoman Turks. Although remembered by Serbs as a calamitous defeat, the military outcome of the Battle of Kosovo seems, in fact, to have been fairly inconclusive. Both uh, leaders on both sides and, and uh, most of the combatants being killed, um, and this is all pretty much in one day of fighting, the myths and legends that grew up around the battle were fashioned soon after its end in epic poems and folk ballads and early on were given a strongly Christian reading by the Serbian Orthodox Church, most conspicuously in the Christ-like characteristics invested in the Serbian leader Prince Lazar, who was said to have chosen a kingdom in heaven over a kingdom on earth, opting to die heroically rather than live in shame. A core theme in the Kosovo myth was the tension between loyalty 
and betrayal, as epitomized in the figures of Milos uh, Obilic, here we are, and uh, Vuk uh, Bronkovic. This tension reflected the historical reality that after the crushing Serbian defeat of 1371, numbers of Serbian warriors, in fact, went over to the Ottoman side and very probably in sharp contradiction uh, 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 to the legend, fought alongside the Turks in the Battle of Kosovo. No less subversive of the myth, Scholars now question whether the historical Vuk Branković, the very picture of evil in Serbian popular memory, truly betrayed the Serbian side in the battle, and whether Milos Obilić, the iconic representative of Serbian loyalty, even existed historically. During the four and a half centuries of Ottoman rule from the mid-15th century to the uh, early 20th century, a number of important changes took place in Kosovo. One was a dramatic shift in the ratio of Serbian to Albanian inhabitants of the area. At the outset, there was an overwhelming uh, Serb majority in Kosovo, but in the late 19th century, the Kosovo population consisted of a little over 70% Albanians. A second important change that took place in Kosovo during the Ottoman period was the increased, increasing Islamization of the population. Most of the Albanians, originally Roman Catholic, having become Muslims. Despite these developments, much as in the case of the Jewish people and Palestine, the ethnic and religious changes that occurred in Kosovo under the Ottomans had little apparent effect on the enduring belief among most Serbs that Kosovo represented, uh, re represented sacred soil. By the time we get to the 19th century and the first stirrings of nationalism among the Serbian people, the Kosovo legend embodying sizable departures from what is believed to have actually taken place historically was already firmly in place. But this didn't keep it from evolving evolving uh, uh, further, as two celebrated figures in the world of Serbian letters, uh, Vuk of uh, Karadzic and Petar Petrovic Niegos, there we are, um, adapted the Kosovo legend to the new tide of nationalism. Karadzic, with his published compilations of Serbian epic ballads, transformed the stories of Lazar and the Battle of Kosovo from oral lore into coherent written narratives that supplied Serbian national ideology with its mythical foundations. Niegos, who ruled the ethnically Serbian territory of Montenegro, just to the, um, just, just to the west of uh, uh, Kosovo, which is dark on the, on the map. Um, uh, through his enormously influential uh, poetic drama, The Mountain Wreath, which some Serbs believe to have been the greatest uh, work ever composed in, uh, in Serbian, introduced into Serbian nationalism a rhetoric marked by uncompromising violence, departing in flagrant fashion from the actual history of Muslims in Montenegro, uh, which was far less bloody, and incorporating a vision of Christianity in which nothing was holier than taking revenge against your enemies. A leading Serbian literature scholar, um, Vasa uh, Mihailovic, um, has contended that Serbs, whenever faced with critical junctures in their history, have invariably turned to the Kosovo story as a source of strength and inspiration. It's significant in this light that for some time after the conclusion of World War I, which brought an end to the Ottoman Empire and the liberation of all Serbian lands, including Kosovo, from Turkish rule, there was a sharp decline in Kosovo motifs in Serbian literature. The flip side of this, of course, was that the allure of Kosovo traditions and stories would 
the, uh, what might be expected to return the moment the Serbs as a people again felt humiliated, victimized, and oppressed, which is exactly what happened in the last several decades of the 20th century, a time when Kosovo themes once again dominated Serbian culture and political consciousness. The Battle of Kosovo has been usefully viewed by the psychiatrist Vamik uh, Volkan as an example of what he calls a chosen trauma, a concept that he also applies to a number of other famous uh, battles in world history. The concept of chosen trauma, according to him, refers to the shared mental representation of a large group's massive trauma experienced by its ancestors at the hands of an enemy group, and the images of heroes, victims, or both connected with it. Of course, large groups do not intend to be victimized, but they choose to mythologize and psychologize the mental representation of the event. Thus, the reality of what happened during the Battle of Kosovo did not matter to the next generations of Serbian people. What mattered was the evolution of the mental representation of this battle as a chosen trauma. A second example of this process of adaptation of ancient story to current historical circumstances is that of Joan of Arc in World War II France. This example was more complicated than the Kosovo uh, the Kosovo one, owing to the fact that both Charles de Gaulle and Philippe Pétain, the two main political leaders during the war, uh, strongly identified with Joan, even though they were on opposite sides of the conflict. The story of Joan of Arc, who became a French patriot and a Roman Catholic saint, is known worldwide. She was born in 1412 into a farming family in the town of Domremy in the northeastern uh, France, uh, the, uh, uh, and much uh, it was during it was during the Hundred Years' War uh, went between England and France, uh, and much of northern France at the time was occupied by uh, by the English. The uh, in 1425, Joan still still a girl first heard voices from God that instructed her to go into the heart of France. And much of northern France, uh, excuse me, um, in 1429, just four years later, um, after repeatedly hearing her voices, she left with a retinue of six men for the western city of Chinon, where the French heir apparent Charles had his castle. Although at times in her brief career, Joan described her mission broadly as being to drive the English from France. On reaching Chinon, she announced that she had two specific objectives. To raise the English siege of Orléans, which had begun some months earlier, and to escort the Dauphin, the French heir apparent, uh, to the city of Reims in the northeast uh, to be anointed and crowned. She accomplished both of these goals and also won uh, a number of additional battles against the English. Although eventually she was captured by French allies of the English, the Burgundians, uh, subjected to a rigged trial and condemned to death, less than a quarter century after her death, King Charles drove the English from France bringing an end to the Hundred Years' War. In the hands of a leader like de Gaulle, the meaning of the Joan story was fairly straightforward. Just as Joan of Arc had devoted her brief life to bringing an end to foreign occupation of France in the 15th century, de Gaulle led the resistance to the German occupation during the war. Pétain also identified with this core theme in the Joan narrative, but his 
uh, more literal. Uh, his identification was, was more literal um, uh, as an ally of France's German conquerors, the Vichy leader was free to target the English specifically as the object of Joan of Arc's enmity and to portray himself because he had made peace with the Germans, uh, thereby saving France from utter devastation as a Joan-like savior of France in the 1940s. In other respects, to be sure, Vichy's reinvention of Joan of Arc as an example for French youth in an environment imbued with fascist values and as a model of conventional female domesticity praised more for her sewing than for her military prowess must have struck a hollow note among many of Joan's 20th century compatriots. Nevertheless, although Vichy's efforts to align the Joan of Arc story with the Pétain government's values and goals were forced, to say the least. The fact that the Pétainistes saw such alignment as important was in itself of great significance. It spoke to the desirability shared by many in France at the time of having Joan of Arc on and by their side during a moment of severe national crisis, regardless of what she was said to represent. Um, one of the two uh, competing ways in which Joan was represented was in her manner of dress. Uh, and this has been a subject of cultural studies courses and, and, um, and, and uh, gender courses and so on in more recent, uh, more recent times. On the left, you see Joan in her preferred uh, male military uh, garb, a knight's garb, actually. Uh, and on the right, you see her dressed in a, um, in a female uh, garb, uh, which was much uh, preferred uh, b by the uh, Roman Catholic clergy, clergy in France. And indeed, um, her insistence upon her male, uh, male dress was one of the heresies that was brought against her uh, in, the, in the judgment um, uh, <clears throat> against her. Now, what I call the power of story although bearing a special relationship to history, permeates virtually all human activities. Indeed, I argue in my book that the utilization, creation, telling, and remembering of stories uh, are an essential part of what it means to be human. If this is so, I argue further, a plausible answer to the question Jerome Bruner poses concerning human beings' seemingly innate addiction to story may well be that like walking on two feet, on two legs, having an opposable thumb, and thinking that babies are cute, our reliance on story is a direct consequence of biological evolution. There are quite a number of people in the literature field today who have become um, deeply involved in uh, what is called so evolution, evolutionary psychology. There is a sub sort of a sub, subset um, of in the psychology field and who, who argue that the, um, that the emergence of story uh, took place at a, at a very, very uh, uh, ancient uh, time in the history of uh, Homo sapiens. There's a strong, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, these people argue that, uh, that, that virtually all of the things that we think dream, desire, do, and experience um, are expressed in narrative form. And then if we couldn't do this, um, it, uh, it, it, would, it would have weakened um, Homo sapiens um, in its evolution over uh, many, many centuries. There is a strong possibility, in short, that our brain's capacity to organize nearly everything that happens in our lives in narrative terms, thereby introducing intelligibility, including an understanding of cause and effect, um, into what would otherwise be utter chaos, gave human beings at some point in the remote past an incalculable survival advantage over those species that could not do this or did it less well. The fact 
that story is ubiquitous and takes the same basic form across cultures doesn't mean, of course, that all stories are alike or that they perform the same kinds of functions in the lives of all individuals and societies. Although focusing in some instances on individuals, in other instances on important battles, and in yet other uh, instances on a combination of the two, the stories dealt with in my book possess a common and quite specific set of characteristics. However much modified, mythologized, distorted, and misrepresented over the centuries, none of the stories was totally fabricated. They all had roots in actual historical occurrences and may thus be referred to as history stories. Although oral transmission played an important part in keeping some of the stories alive, this was especially true in the case of the Kosovo mythology, they were also, without exception, eventually set down in writing, circulated for centuries, and very often uh, and, uh, and, and, and were known far and wide within the lens of their origin. All of the stories, moreover, with the partial exception of Masada, had named, named protagonists and more often than not supplied cognitive models that people individually or collectively could readily relate to and measure their own thoughts and actions against. And finally, it's noteworthy that the stories I deal with in every instance were in every instance revived and popularized in the 20th century in response to societal crises pertaining mainly to war or the threat of war and sooner or later in this setting received strong support from the state. Much of the power of the stories dealt with derived from their capacity to speak metaphorically to what was happening or had recently happened or was threatening to happen in the near future to people in the historical present. This symbolic parallelism between story and historical setting is a fundamental reason for the pervasive appeal of each story explored. The right story in such circumstances hammers away at a particular theme or set of themes very clearly and compellingly, thus challenging people to see through the clutter of their everyday lives and recognize what is truly important to them at a particular moment in time. Such stories are not personal stories. Rather, they are collective in nature, shared with other members of the community, almost all of whom were introduced to them from a very early age. The Israeli philosopher Abishai Margalit, in discussing his notion of a community of memory, asserts that, quote, human beings lead collective existences based on symbols that encapsulate shared memories. These shared memories, not the past itself, Ernest Renan long ago cautioned, but the stories we tell one another about the past are what bind national communities together in the present, becoming a part of the rich legacy of memories such communities hold in common. In other words, the power of the stories discussed in my book, although deriving in substantial measure from their metaphoric embodiment of what was taking place in the historical present, also fed on the fact that the stories constituted a vital part of a shared or popular uh, store of memories, sometimes referred to as a form of folk knowledge, that fostered group coalescence and made it possible for the members of the group to think of themselves and behave as a community. Bruner has similar things to say about the relationship between common stories and the human groups or communities in which they circulate. The sharing of such stories, he states, and I quote, uh, creates an interpretive community uh, that is critically important for promoting cultural cohesion, end quote. 
Or, as Jonathan Gottschall has pithily put it, story is the glue of human social life, defining groups and holding them together. What all these individuals are apparently suggesting is that some form of symbolic sharing, whether in the form of stories or memories, uh, is absolutely key both to a culture's objective existence and to an individual's subjective sense of belonging to that culture. Objectively, as the China historian Mark Elvin uh, puts it, quote, shared stories define the space in which a particular human group operates. It's conceptualized physical landscape, end quote. Subjectively, common stories and memories are the very stuff out of which the imagined communities Benedict Anderson describes are formed. Although Anderson's notion of imagined communities is applicable to a variety of communal realms, religious, cultural, um, and so on, he uses it primary, primarily uh, to refer to nations, a particular form of political uh, community. A nation, according to him, is imagined because the members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members, meet them, or even hear of them. Yet in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. A nation is imagined as a community because despite the differences prevailing within it, it is always conceived as a deep horizontal comradeship. The stories that circulate among the members of such a community, I would add, constitute at all times a special cultural language for discussing matters of immediate concern. And in times of peril more than ever, they supply a floor of reassurance that individual fears and worries about what is happening or what may happen are shared in common by other members of the community. In addition to the horizontal comradeship Anderson refers to, there's also a vertical dimension to the stories that circulate in and to some extent define a national community. This dimension ties the community's members to a shared or at least a partially shared past. It fleshes out the sense of identity of the community members by telling them where they have come from and where they might be headed. It should be clear at this point why the members of a national community instinctively turn to certain kinds of stories when the community's survival is at stake. Personal stories, the primary concern of many writers on narrative based on the premise that stories are a fundamental part of the way in which uh, individuals process experience and understand the world, won't do in such situations. Instead, collective stories, stories that are widely known within a community that are part of its heritage are needed. But not just any old collective stories. The stories needed must be closely aligned in content and structure with the crisis in which the community is embroiled. This is what Margalit uh, is getting at when he asks, why did Stalin, an arch manipulator, when locked in a war of life and death with the invading Nazis, invoke the national memories of great patriots from Tsarist Russia rather than working class memories that he was ideologically supposed to represent. Stalin invoked the memory of Alexander Nevsky, um, who defeated the Teutonic Knights in the 13th century, rather than the memory of Karl Marx, and of Ivan the Terrible, who defeated the Tartars at Kazan in the 16th century, rather than uh, Friedrich uh, Engels. And on, on the right-hand side, you have a still of, um, of Nevsky in the, in the film, Alexander uh, Nevsky. Beyond being attractive, attracted to collective, uh, to collective narratives that bear a metaphoric 
likeness to the crisis a community is undergoing. The members of the community, as I suggested earlier, are also drawn to stories that show a way out of the crisis and are therefore a source of sorely needed hope and encouragement. This would characterize both of the films uh, that I deal with in the fifth chapter of, of my book, Henry V and Alexander Nevsky. In both instances, uh, they faced a much more powerful foe and uh, overcame these foes and saved, saved, uh, saved the day for their, for their countries and their countrymen. At the end of my book, I turn to the key issue um, of the tension between critical history and popular memory. History, according to a French historian, uh, Roger Chartier, uh, while one of many forms of narration is nevertheless singular in that it maintains a special relationship to truth. More precisely, its narrative constructions aim at reconstructing a past that really was. No one ever said this was easy, but as another well-known historian, um, George uh, Iggers has put it, there remains a fundamental difference between postmodern theories that deny any claim to reality in historical accounts and a historiography that is fully conscious of the complexity of historical knowledge, but still assumes that real people had real thoughts and feelings that led to real actions that, within limits, can be known and reconstructed. As I make amply clear in my book, the mythology surrounding the Battle of Kosovo and Joan of Arc uh, serving as cases in point, uh, this view of the aim of history is sometimes accompanied compromised or even completely displaced by other aims, the common element of which is their structuring of the past in such a way that it lends support to present purposes and aspirations. A concern for truth may be part of the process or it may not, but either way, a truthful picture of the past is not the thing that is of paramount concern. What is of the utmost importance is framing the past interpretively in such a way that it makes the present, the desired present, seem to evolve directly or at least plausibly from it. The construction, to put it somewhat differently, of a narrative that while professing to square the present with the past, in fact, does the very reverse of this, redefining the past so as to accommodate a preferred present. Although the rewriting of the Masada and Kosovo stories, not to mention uh, the story of Joan of Arc uh, under Vichy, uh, was particularly blatant, the fact is all of the stories dealt with in my book and a great many other history stories not included in it have undergone a comparable rewriting process. And it doesn't seem to matter to most people, even if they suspect, as some of them surely must do, that the stories have been modified over time. If, writes the British historian David Lowenthal, Oliver Goldsmith was appalled by the ecclesiastical beggars who rattled off lies and legends as facts at Westminster Abbey's Poets' Corner. Most viewers neither seek objective veracity nor mind if it is absent. Echoing Washington Irving's indulgence of spurious Shakespeare relics at Stratford in 1815, they are, quote, ever willing to be deceived where the deceit is pleasant and costs nothing. What is it to us whether these stories be true or false, so long as we can persuade ourselves into the belief of them? What is the basis for this seeming indifference to truth? I've already hinted at an answer to this question. Let me enlarge on it. Another British historian, J.H. Uh, Plum, in his 1969 book entitled The Death of the Past, maintained that the past, by which he meant what I call 
popular or folk or collective uh, memory, should never be confused with critical history. True history, he wrote, is at bottom destructive, its role being to cleanse the story of mankind from those deceiving visions of a purposeful past. The French historian Pierre Nora, in his celebrated seven-volume work, Les Lieux de Mémoire, uh, made much the same point when he wrote that, quote, memory is always suspect in the eyes of history whose true mission is to demolish it, to repress it, end quote. He did not, however, think that this was a good thing. Uh, and so, along with his collaborators, set about reconstructing as many sites as possible that were evocative of French collective memory. Lowenthal, although using the term heritage for collective memory in his book Possessed by the Past, fully agrees with Nora, uh, contending that, quote, heritage no less than history is essential to knowing and acting, um, end quote, and arguing that by means of it, we tell ourselves who we are, where we come from, and, what, and to what we belong. The connection Lowenthal draws between heritage and identity is beautifully captured um, in an exchange between the American novelist uh, Jonathan Safran Foer and his six-year-old son to whom he often read uh, children's versions of Old Testament stories. After hearing about the death of Moses for the umpteenth time, how he took his last breaths overlooking a promised land that he would never enter, the son asked if Moses was a real person. I don't know, Foer told him, but we're related to him. The American historian uh, Bernard Balin also addressed the uneasy relationship between history and memory with great eloquence at a 1998 conference on the Atlantic slave trade that almost broke up when many of the black scholars in attendance, as well as others, reacted heatedly to the cold, statistically grounded, scholarly presentations on the trade. Balin drew a sharp contrast between the critical scientific historical writing, which was all head and no heart, and kept its distance from the past it was bent on recovering, and memory, the relationship of which to the past was more an embrace. Memory, he contended, is not a critical, skeptical reconstruction of what happened. It is the spontaneous, unquestioned experience of the past. It is absolute, not tentative or distant, and it is expressed in signs and signals, symbols, images, and mnemonic clues of all sorts. It shapes our awareness, whether we know it or not, and it is ultimately emotional, not intellectual. While these writers all accentuate the contrast between critical history and popular memory, a contrast I repeatedly emphasize myself in my book. This distinction is not, in fact, the whole story. The truth is, there is a great deal of overlap between academic history, the kind I do, um, and the history stories um, I deal with uh, in the book, which is the prime reason for the confusion that exists between the two in many people's minds. Popular memory, I point out repeatedly, often has a genuine historical component. There really was a battle between the Serbs and the Turks at Kosovo in 1389, a Roman siege of Jerusalem and destruction of the Second Temple of the Jews in 70 CE, a, a plucky French maid named Joan of Arc who fought the English occupiers of northern France and was burned at the stake in 1431, a King Gojin who ruled uh, a state called Yue in the latter part of the Zhou dynasty and eventually triumphed over his rival, uh, the neighboring state of Wu, and so on. How is a person untrained as a historian, or even a historian, if she or he happens to be unfamiliar with the aspect of the past that the story relates to, to know which parts of the story dealing with such people and events are authentic 
and which parts are the product of inventive minds. A problem that people today confront constantly when we see historical dramatizations in film uh, or on TV or the stage or read historical fiction based on a core of actual historical persons and events. I recently read two uh, uh, terrific works of historical fiction by um, a Stanford University uh, psychoanalyst, uh, Irvin D. Yalom, um, The Spinoza Problem and When Nietzsche Wept. Yalom, unlike many authors of historical novels, includes a note at the end of each work telling the reader what parts and which characters are fabricated. These notes are helpful, but also deeply deceptive, because by fictionalizing the environment within which the nonfiction aspects of the works operate, he unavoidably ends up fictionalizing those nonfiction aspects as well. This is one side of the problem, the frequent difficulty of distinguishing with clarity between fact and fiction, between what is true and what is not. Another is that serious historians, although striving to reconstruct the past as it really was, can never fully succeed in this venture. Where full and reliable data are lacking, which is invariably the case, we habitually make inferences, some of which are later shown to be wrong. And beyond this, historians are never entirely impervious to the collective memory of the society in which they live, which means that even as we strive to identify and undermine the mythic aspects of our knowledge of the past, uh, a sacred part of our responsibility as historians, we inevitably introduce into our accounts new myths, although we may not think of them as such, that are reflective of the values and thought patterns that happen to be important to people in our own day. This is what we mean, part of it uh, at any rate, when we say that each generation makes its own history. It is what the sociologist Barry Schwartz had in mind when he says that the remembering of Abraham Lincoln and presumably a good many other important historical figures must be regarded, quote, as a constructive process as opposed to a retrieval process, end quote. That within limits, each generation of Americans has had its own Lincoln, who differed in major or minor ways from the Lincoln of earlier generations. And shifting from heroic individuals to complex, large-scale events, it's what the documentary filmmaker Ken Burns uh, means when he writes of the American propensity to rethink periodically the meaning of the Civil War. What this complicated relationship between critical history and popular memory suggests is that Bernard Balin's comment at the 1998 conference on the Atlantic slave trade would perhaps benefit from a slight shift of emphasis. At the moment when he made his remarks to say nothing of the sensitivity of the issue to which they were addressed, it must have seemed necessary and desirable to draw the line between critical history and popular memory hard and fast. But although it's true that good history writing is always attentive to the distance of the real past from the present, David Lo Lowenthal and another of his works famously referred to the past as a foreign country, it is not true that it is always all head and no heart. Balin himself seems to acknowledge as much when he asserts that, quote, perhaps history and memory may act usefully upon each other, end quote. I would reframe this in still stronger language and ask whether it is uh, whether it is not inevitable that they interact in this way. In J.H. Plum's view, the distinguished French uh, historian Marc Bloch possessed the power to abstract himself from any preconceived notions about the past and to investigate an historical problem with detachment. And yet, detached as he was, 
his imagination, his creative invention, his sense of humanity infused all that he did. This infusion, in my, uh, in my humble opinion, is what good historical scholarship should aspire to. But it would be a mistake to believe that it can ever give us the past as it really was. For despite the most painstaking efforts to reconstruct such a past, efforts I wholeheartedly applaud, the questions we ask and that guide our research and writing will unavoidably be informed in substantial measure by the present in which we, like everyone else, live with all its values, assumptions, anxieties, foibles, and uh, preferred uh, myths or mythic preferences. Uh, and this circumstance more or less ensures that the product of our efforts as historians will embody a tension between the past as it really was and the past we seek to illuminate and understand. Thank you. So I sit down now? Okay. You want to move it back? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, for that fantastic talk and presentation and for the for the wonderful book too. There is um, uh, about half an hour uh, for questions and answers and I think somebody will come with a microphone if you um, put your hand up to ask a question. Um, let me exercise my prerogative and ask the first one if I may. And it's really to ask you to say a bit more about what these stories, how they're used, what they're for once we've chosen them. Because you spend a lot of time in the book telling the, describing the process, a very fascinating process whereby in the past something happens or probably happens, it gets remembered, it gets textualized, it gets retextualized, it gets transformed, changed, shared, and then at some point adopted by, by, a, by a community or a group as being a story special to them. And yet one of the things that seems almost counterintuitive about the stories that you've chosen is that many of them are stories of failure, of defeat. Yep. You could say that the Henry V and the um, uh, Alexander Nevsky, these are victory stories, but yep. the, other, the others right. really are all stories. Yeah, yeah. And the Masada story is a story of defeat. I mean, the Roman soldiers so, completely uh, over, well, uh, the, the Jewish warriors, according to legend, all committed mass suicide rather than turn themselves over to the, Russia, to the Romans. So I, I guess my question is, are these defeat stories performing the same function for a community as victory stories? Well, if you're talking about, if we're talking about a story's capacity to inspire, uh, I would say yes. Um, this is the point that uh, uh, Mihalovic, uh, the Serbian literature scholar, makes with regard to the Kosovo story, that it was a source of inspiration, a source of, uh, 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 despite the defeat. Certainly, um, Masada, uh, uh, although filled with all kinds of ambiguities and although changing over time, um, was also a, uh, a story that... Um, that inspired. Um, uh, it's a very, uh, in a way, the capacity of stories about failure um, uh, to inspire later generations seems almost more powerful than the capacity of uh, stories that have 
you know, triumphant engine, end, uh, endings. Uh, so in the, yeah. in the Kosovo battles, they're actually making it worse as it, as it gets remembered. It, more of a defeat, more of a disaster. And that seems to be even more inspiring. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's, it's fascinating. The, uh, um, I think that uh, 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 Volkan Vomik has, has a lot of interesting stuff to say about this from a psychological um, uh, standpoint. Um, but it's very, you know, now in the case, in the case of Masada, when um, Jews um, first uh, became familiar with Masada, because Masada was a part of Jewish history that was really on the periphery uh, for centuries. And then in the 10th century, um, it was uh, included in a, uh, um, in, in a work in, 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 in Europe and, and, and spread around and was translated into various, uh, various languages. But it was never really profound. And then in 1927, I think it was, a, um, a Jewish writer who had come from Ukraine and gone to uh, Palestine um, wrote a poem called Masada, which is a very, it's a grim and dark poem in many ways. And it's, um, there's this sense that, uh, that you're fighting against fate, and God is fate, and, 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 and he's on the other side. And it's, it's re but there's just that, that, that sliver of a possibility that maybe um, you can make it work. And this became enormously uh, influential um, in, uh, in Palestine, and it was a required uh, required uh, in the 1930s and 40s in, in school books and so on. But the meaning of Masada really underwent substantial changes over time. When it first became, in the 1920s, um, Jews who came from uh, Eastern Europe, they had these uh, huge adjustments to make of the food that was eaten, the climate, um, there were no social services. It was, uh, it was, it was a, and, and Masada really became a, um, a symbol uh, for uh, survival against all hope. Um, and then later on, it became a much more of a military symbol as, uh, as a new generation of uh, Jews who were born in Palestine uh, emerges and who don't, uh, who are accustomed to the environment and they don't have to make the adjustments their parents and grandparents made. So, so it, it's, it's really interesting to see how the story um, evolves, the meaning of the story evolves over time. And then in the uh, 1960s, 1970s, it begins to sort of um, lose its attractiveness to a lot of, a lot of, a lot of Jews. And, and then, then the right becomes more powerful in, in Israel and it becomes attractive again. It's, it's fascinating to see how it works. So what, what's essential to the process is that there has to be in the present tense a hook. The hook is very important, yes. But the hook can change. The hook change. It does change, invariably, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's see if there are questions from out there. If you have a question, just indicate that the microphone will come to you. Thank you, Professor Cohen. Uh, thank you. Wonderful uh, talk. Um, I have a simple question. Um, in some cases, um, popular memory of a past event or figure in time of crisis could be shared by people from another very different community or nation at another time period. For example, the story of Jean, Jean of Arc in late Qing and early Republican China. In other words, the same story could be rewritten or retold in a cross-cultural context for either a similar or a different purpose. So do you think that these retold stories, if taken into consideration, may bring new light to your research so that in your next book, you would change to yet another pattern of historical narrative. Thank you. Um, well, uh, if you want to be that specific, I think the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm quite aware of uh, the, uh, I mean, one of the things, the first things that you encounter with Joan of Arc is that unlike, um, say, the story of Masada uh, or the story of Kosovo, uh, it uh, almost instantaneously uh, becomes global property. 
Um, you have story, you have plays and, and symphonies and you know, all kinds of things in different, different countries. And in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, it, uh, Joan of Arc becomes a very attractive symbol in Egypt, in, in, uh, in, in China, um, particularly among feminists who are seeking a different role for women in Chinese life or in Egyptian. Uh, huh? A long time. <laughs> right, right, right. So it's, um, uh, it's, it's, a, very good, it's a very good point. Um, these stories, um, it's sort of like what uh, Professor Kerr, uh, Kerr said, uh, that you, you need a hook, but the hook isn't always the same. And the hook that, uh, that, that latches onto the Joan of Arc story in 1920s China is different from the hook that, um, that, uh, that was there in World War II France. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, I would say the same thing uh, with regard to uh, my last book on, on the Go Gen story, um, which at various points in the 20th century in China, um, it was a different part of the story that um, attracted the uh, that was appeal um, for the for the uh, for the nationalists after they fled uh, after the civil war they fled to Taiwan. Um, what was appealing was the fact that Yue was the state of Yue was a small, um, not nearly as powerful uh, state uh, as compared to the state of Wu, um, and it took many years of uh, of. Uh, of social and economic um, uh, policy making and, and militarization and, uh, and so on by Gojen, according to the legend, um, in the state of Yue, before Yue became powerful enough to overcome uh, the, state, uh, the state of Wu. So this was very attractive to people um, in Taiwan after 1949-50. And Taiwan was just a small um, you know, island uh, with a very small population, um, and it was facing off against this uh, huge, uh, territorially and demographically huge um, uh, uh, country uh, to the north. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, so that, that part of the story was, was really attractive. Uh, to them, and then in the early '60s, when there was a uh, the Great Leap Forward famine um, on the mainland, um, there was a famine that took place within the Gojen story as well. So that was applied to the. It, it, I mean, it's, it's the some of these stories were more complicated than others. Um, I sort of feel as though the Masada story itself is fairly simple. Um, the Joan of Arc story is very complicated. Um, the Gojen story is very complicated. Um, so it's you know it's, there's there's room for a play on both the side of the story and the history that the story um, ends up being matched up against. Another question. Peter. Thanks, Paul, for a very stimulating talk. Uh, I guess to those of us here who are practicing historians, what you've had to say tonight is actually rather sobering uh, because what you're saying is really that it doesn't matter what we say from the critical historian's point of view. Those people out there are going to believe whatever they want to believe and there's not much we can do about it. And I guess we've all had this experience in our professional lives. I'd like to ask you a personal question about this because I imagine that when you come across people who say crazy things about the boxes uh, that have no uh, real uh, factual basis, you probably feel the same way that I feel about people who say crazy things about the history of Hong Kong U, uh, which has a similar lack of factual basis. So um, perhaps you'd like to just share with us how you as a historian react personally to this sort of uh, dilemma that we find ourselves in. Well, I, I mean, I, in, in the case of the boxers, from the very beginning of my um, uh, research on the boxers, I knew that I was not just going to deal with the boxers as sort of in conventional 
a historical reconstruction of an event. I knew that I wanted to deal, as, get as deeply as I could into the experiential uh, dimension. And I knew that, uh, in fact, this was the part that I actually wrote the first, um, that there were all kinds of myths that grew up uh, about the boxers, starting when the, when the, when the, uh, the when the uprising was still in progress, um, and which uh, uh, were, in some cases, uh, the Western uh, mythology and the Chinese mythology overlapped. In other cases, um, it didn't. Um, the, uh, but it, it, I mean, uh, that was that was my interest as a historian from the beginning, not just what happened, what were the boxers about, but what was it like to be a boxer, and what was it like to figure out what the meaning of the boxer uprising was for you uh, in the 1960s during the Cultural Revolution, or um, some other uh, point in time during the, uh, the new culture period in the, uh, between you know, the late teens and the, uh, and the 1920s, um, when the attitudes of Chinese towards the boxers were radically different in the two periods, the Cultural Revolution and the New Culture uh, period. Um, and, but that, that was a primary interest of mine from the very... Uh, and what I tried to point out in the conclusion of that book is that the historian is always present. You don't just write the history of the boxers. You also write the history of the mythologization of the boxers. Um, and they're both legitimate. I mean, they're, they're, uh, as, as historical topics, if you will. Uh, so, I mean, for me, you made it specific with regard to the boxers. That was never really a problem for me. I always had an answer. <laughs> Another question. Um, OK, let, let me put another one, since I, I perceive a space to insert it. Um, and the really fascinating thing about these history stories is, as, as you tell the story, that they kind of emerge organically. That they're different from propaganda stories, for example, which are definitely constructed with a certain aim in mind. With um, the partial exception of the two films. Because in both, I mean, in, in the case of Henry, Henry V, yeah. Churchill was directly involved. In yeah. the case of Alexander Nevsky, Stalin was directly involved. I mean, they, they, they called some of the shots. They said, no, we'll leave that part out. And, you know, uh, Stalin was interested in being identified with Alexander Nevsky as, as a hero. And so, you know, at, at one, in one of the earlier versions of the Hel Alexander Nevsky, he dies. Uh, he is poisoned. He dies. And, no, Stalin. No, he, he doesn't die. You know. <laughs> I mean, the, it seems to me when when you publish the second edition of this book, you should alter the title to "History in Popular Memory and Literature," because oh. the the textualization of, of these stories is is what is carrying you through. Anyway, sorry. That's. Well, you could write that book. Yeah. Professional, <laughs> professional footnote. Um, but my question. No, I mean, it's, it's, there's no question about the fact that literature plays a very important role. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So the, the question is, is actually a forward-looking one. Is it possible to predict how another such story might become the sort of myth that you spoke about in this five or six? Think about China, for example, the Long March or. German Square or some of these important events, can you predict how one might emerge as the kind of story that you've talked about here? Well, it's interesting, I mean, that you mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the uh, China, the, the case of the, uh, the first reaction that a lot of people, I wasn't here at the time, but I came a few days later, but when the uh, uh, when the protesters in Hong Kong, uh, when the police um, uh, used tear gas against them and pepper, pepper spray. Um, this was, for a lot of people, I, I gather in Hong Kong, this was the point at which people got really scared. Um, is, is the PLA going to come, uh, you know, is, is the advent of the PLA just right around the corner? Um, is this the end for Hong Kong? You know, I mean, a lot of, you know, um, 
And what's so ironic about this is that in the case of, the, of Tiananmen in 1989, people were saying, why bullets? Why couldn't they have used tear gas? Which is sort of a, the normal you know, um, kind, type of uh, 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 way of dealing with, uh, with, with rioting uh, citizenry. <laughs> Almost anything might emerge as, as kind of myth that you've been talking about, yep. depending on the, the circumstances at the time, I mean, in the present tense. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Right. Mm, okay. Um, any, we have time for a couple more questions. John. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. What are some of the stories that you left out, or some of the stories that didn't make the cut when you were, when you were planning your book? It didn't work that way. You asked me a similar question when I gave a sort of at a very introductory point in my research. I gave one of those lunch conversations. And uh, how did you pick that? You know, out of 200, 300, how did you pick the ones? You, I said, that's not the way it worked. In fact, um, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that uh, uh, it was owing to Chris Munn that I dealt with Henry V. Uh, Chris and I were having lunch uh, one day, about four or five years ago, I guess, and uh, uh, he asked me what I'm working on, and I told him, and, and at that time I was sort of focusing on Kosovo and Gojin and Joan of Arc, and he says, what about Henry V? And I said, uh, tell me more, you know? <laughs> and, um, you know, as, as, as I became, as I familiarized myself with not just the, the, uh, the Shakespearean play, but also with the uh, Olivier um, re, um, redo of the Olivier play. Um, you know, the, the point quickly became clear that this was an excellent. Uh, I hadn't been thinking in terms of films. Um, and then uh, it was just about three or four months later, I was at the Fairbanks Center at Harvard having lunch with some friends there, and I asked, you know, so, you know, what are you doing now? To, you know, you asked us of, of retired people, because you know, what do retired people do, you know? Um, you, you know, you know what you, you do if you're not retired. Um, and so I said, I, I mentioned, uh, and I said, and, and I, uh, a friend in, in Hong Kong suggested I, that I include this story of Henry, uh, Olivier's Henry V. Uh, and, uh, and I thought that the more I got into that, the more it seemed like a really good idea. And he said, what about Alexander Nevsky? And <laughs> it, it, I mean, so it was more a, um, it was more a building process uh, from somebody who was very inexperienced who certainly was not familiar with world history um, and still not. Uh, um, I did encounter in the course of my researches um, a lot of other possible, uh, uh, the, uh, the Battle of uh, Cane in Roman history, uh, another defeat, um, the uh, Battle of Bila, uh, Bila Hora, uh, White Mountain in, um, in uh, Czechoslovakian history, which the, uh, the Habsburg Empire came down hard on, on the Czechs. It was a terrible defeat. Um, every year it gets memorialized um, in, in Czechoslovakia. Um, the Battle of Wounded Knee um, in American um, history, um, when the 7th Cavalry Regiment kills a lot, of, uh, a lot of American Indians. It's still commemorated every year by Native Americans. Um, so it's, it's, again, both of these cases are sort of bad endings which get commemorated perhaps more meaningfully um, in some situations than, than good endings. Thank you, Professor Cohen. It's a wonderful talk. Um, the, the, the book, I congratulate you for the, for the design of the cover. The history and story together. And I'm enlightened to learn the ancestry of our profession, that actually we historians are actually all came from the story, the, the needs for stories in our species back to the homo sapiens age. Um, <laughs> you made the mythologizing story and changing it as the, the, the key, the, the main theme of the book. And in reference to the history that seemed to be the norm of the profession, 
I want to flip this to the other side. When did history became cool-headed, uh, all brain, no heart, has to be objective for the fact. You know, if you think about the Yue Wang Goujian story, it actually we learn it uh, from the history writing. So even at that time, the history, you know, Guo Yu or, or Zhuo Zhuan, that time, the story and history seem to be more or less together. Right, but you don't. I mean, the, the, the story of Yue Wang Goujian mm. that people, Chinese, encountered in the 20th century was not the story, the, is not the original uh, story uh, from the Zhuo Zhuan. And, 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 and um, it was more, much more uh, influenced by the Wu Ye Chun Chiu, um, which, which uh, influenced uh, uh, some of the major 20th century redos of the Gojen story um, in, in China. So a lot of uh, stuff. I mean, um, uh, Xi Shi, the number of people uh, Chinese scholars have argued that, you know, um, uh, like uh, Milos Obilich in Serbian history, she sure never really existed. Um, and it was one of these stories. If she never, ex if she didn't exist, you had to invent her, right? Um, or the love affair between she sure and Fan Li, you know. Uh, um, so it's already, it, it's already deeply impregnated with stuff that never really happened um, uh, by the time it gets to to China in the 20th century. Um, so I think, this, I think this is just, this is the way it, this is the way it works. Uh, these stories are, they're almost like, uh, uh, maybe it's not the right word to use, uh, living organisms. I mean, they, they move through time, they're constantly evolving, changing, picking up uh, things that are important in one period, uh, dropping things that are no longer important, and they, they evolve. Um, the stories evolve. They, all the ones that, that I dealt with evolved in, in, in this way, but they all had a real historical beginning. Um, that I don't, don't know if that's... Yeah, so great. What I'm, I want you to elaborate, here you're elaborating, is the history part. That history, uh, you know, this is a fantastic story, what the people uh, in different time and places use old his, uh, stories to answer their own crisis. That's very enlightening. But history seemed to be uh, under problematized in this story be, of, be, of the relationship between the two. Seems like in your presentation, the history is, we, we always try to be as objective and factual as it is. But actually, history writing is also a kind of uh, manipulation but di very different kind of mani manipulation that at a certain time in human history this um, value of history being cool-headed and objective became the identity of the profession but that comes uh, much much later could you say something more about why why was it when did this happen and why was it necessary for history profession also if human beings really need story more than history, who would need cool head? I, I don't know if it was. History. I don't know if it was ever necessary mm -hmm. uh, that history uh, should have developed the way it did um, in the Western world in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, uh, but that's the way it developed. I mean, it, it's uh, it's 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 enormously complicated because I think. We, we have at least I for you know when I when I started out um, studying history, um, I uh, it's just like you know a lot of people when they start out studying science, they think the facts are there. We just have to learn the facts. And any decent scientist, they know it's that that's not what what science is all about. Science is a process of of investigation. Um, the uh, in the case of history, I used to, you know, it's just a question of, the facts are all there, I just have to um, retrieve them, and then I know what happened um, in uh, 15th century France. I know what happened in 18th century uh, Germany, whatever. Um, it's, it's, uh, but the deeper you get in, the more you realize that 
these, uh, a discipline like history is a, it's sort of like the calculus. I mean, you get closer and closer to a limit, but you don't ever get there. Um, you don't ever get the truth about what happened in the past, because even as it's happening, the truth is being sort of reconfigured. You know, I'm, if I'm involved in a, uh, if I'm a boxer and I'm involved in a, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in, in some aspect of, uh, of the boxer movement, I have an experience, okay, in the course of a day. Um, by the end of the day, I'm asked uh, by uh, my parents, boxers were very young, many of them, so what did you do today, uh, John? Uh, <laughs> and, and you say, well, and as soon as, as soon as you start to narrativize your experience, the experience that you actually had is, it's, it's not destroyed, but it's, it really undergoes a chemical change. Um, and that's, that's, you know, it's, that's, that's really complicated stuff. I mean, you know, it's, uh, 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 I, I really, in, in writing History in Three Keys that, and, and exploring, you know, for the first time in my uh, 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 life as a historian, you know, trying to get as deeply as I could into what it meant to be an experiencer of the past as opposed to a reconstructor uh, of the past or a mythologizer. Uh, of the past. Um, and it's, I mean, they're all valid ways of addressing the past, but they're different. Um, and none of them are going to give you the comfort of um, reaching final, ultimate truth. It's not, it's not religion, it's history. Yeah. Well, we have used up our time, and that's a pretty good place to stop, I think. So please join me in thanking Professor Paul Cohen very much. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Cohen, and thank you, Professor Kerr. Um, as a small token of the library, we'd, we'd like to present you. Ah, okay. Uh, we'd like to present you with a copy of our Hong Kong Almanac from 1846. Professor Kerr, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for coming. I'd just like to remind you that next Thursday we're having another book talk um, in, in, um, in light of the Argentinian festival of this month. We'll have a book talk on the immigration of theater to, uh, uh, from Asia and Europe. And that book talk is, uh, as I said, a, con a cooperation between the Consul General of Argentina based here in, in Hong Kong and for Macau. And the consulate has also arranged graciously to serve um, Argentinian refreshments that night. So I hope to see you next Thursday for another exciting talk. Thank you for coming. Good night.